when I made phone calls, I, I promised that it would be very informal. Sure. It wouldn't be like we had to put together a, a program or anything. And how this all came about is a couple things. Um, when you grow up in a household like I did with my, my dad that told stories to us on here and everywhere, um, you know, you sit and you listen and whatever, and you think you're going to remember everything. And, you know, now he's been gone five years, and it's like I'll pass by something and I'll say, gosh, I should really remember what I was supposed to remember about that, because he told me that ten times, but I really didn't listen <laughs> every ten times, so now I'm not quite as, you know. So Norman and I kind of talked about um, ways to, to start recording some of this stuff, or, or making a permanent record in some way, shape, or form. And so Norman, I think, visited with Sandwich, mm -hmm. And they have quite a, a program um, put together for oral history. And so we kind of talked about it. We thought, you know, this is really a great idea. So Norman took the ball, that next step. And, you know, he's got an actual outline with questions and has made arrangements to be able to take and, and photograph so that we can have, um, a, or, you know, history that um, down the road people will be able to enjoy. I think everybody that has grown up around here, we've had so many members that over the years have shared so many wonderful stories, and some of it we do have on tape, many of them we don't. But like Francis Stevens, uh, Uncle Stewart was gonna be here tonight, but he just, it just didn't happen. Uh, Ray Davis is in the hospital, she was gonna be here, she didn't come. And you know there were a couple other people that had you know been around. I still want to get them on tape. Get them, you know. Um, Norman said that Stuart came into the museum over the weekend. I actually donated a piece of furniture that came out of the house originally, which I had some other pieces that will be slowly but surely over the summer brought back into the building. And he told Norman a story about he told him where the furniture had been sitting in the in the house. And he said the preacher had come to visit his father and mother. And he was sitting, uh, the preacher was sitting on this settee. And Stuart must have been very little because he crawled under it. And he had to be little because these pieces are very, very low. They're old Victorian furniture. And Stuart crawled under the piece of furniture and was in a humble little kid's suit poking up on the bottom. And the preacher got, Stuart got trouble. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So anyway, those are the kinds of things that, you know, it, it just, that was the whole idea of the evening. So um, those of you that I asked and called and whatever, um, I'd like to invite you to come and sit up front when you kind of talk a little bit because we do really want to get this started and you might be our practice run tonight, but... Uh, you know, if you got anything good to say, we're going to call you back and make you answer the 17-page report that's here with all the questions. <laughs> anyway, that was the, the whole idea behind it. So anyway, I just have a few things to start with. I'm going to break the ice, and then you guys can kind of take over. Did they want, do you want to come up here? You guys want to, yeah, just come up here. Up. We've got Matt Love. Thank you. was still standing at Lee's Mill. It was barely standing, but it was still standing. And around it, there were still wooden plank walkways, and you remember Dick, and we would go down fishing down there, because um, I lived off Lee's, I lived in Kathy Gary's house. And so we were frequent visitors to Lee's Mill, and got in trouble every time I went down there, because we would want to go walking out on those 
two plank things that people tied their steamboats up to. So I just thought it would be fun to, to bring this in. This is actually a photograph, and I believe it's in my father's book as well, but this is of Lee's Mills, um, and it has many of the um, buildings that, of course, were gone when they Anyway, that's what it looked like when I was a kid. And I don't know where Dad came up with that, but anyway, that, that was one thing. And then I'm just going to share one more thing, and then I'm going to let you guys take over. Oh, just, just for the local flavor. This is Bill Clinton at age 72. And the other man is, I think, uh, maybe what, no, William Raymond, I think, was the owner of the boat. Could be John Lockett. I did not even know. John McKinney, maybe, son of the owner. Well, anyway, these guys were people that worked on the boat that was called the Molten Burrow that was originally the center harbor that ended up in its final days down on these mills. So these were the good old boys. I just thought that was kind of fun. The Molten Burrow is still there, actually. The, the wreck of it on the far left, if you go way out, the, the hull is still there, the dry shaft is still there. Really? Yep. And there's a picture of it on, on our Facebook account and our, web, and our website, so. And, and why did it sink? It was just kind of abandoned. It was kind of driven, driven up onto the, the shore, and they used to work on the boats over there, and what they would do is they would sink them in the wintertime so that the ice wouldn't penetrate, um, move them around or whatever, and they never brought it back up. So it just, you know, the water was right up to the decks and uh, just left there. And I love kayaking there. It's a nice spot. By the way, Norman and I grew up next to each other when we were... I was older than him now, so we didn't actually play together, but we were next door neighbors. These pictures, I didn't blow up, um, and I don't want to offend anybody by these, because these are not politically correct in today's world. But the reason I selected these pictures is because when I was a kid, life was very simple in Moulton It was, you know, we, we, um, Went ice skating on Bud's Pond, which Troopy, you know, they, they plowed that, and every Friday night we would go ice skating at Bud's Pond. And if Bud's wasn't, if they couldn't get the snow plows down, they would flood behind the fire station and we skated. We did 4 H, we had programs at the Grange Hall, and the women's club was very active, the Grange was very active. And I just picked some of these because these, these photos just absolutely are hysterical. When I was probably, I would have been maybe six, five, six, seven, something like that, the, the Grange group put on what is called a minstrel show. And, you know, today, if you, let me ask our young generation, do you know what a minstrel show is? No. <laughs> And I can guarantee if you brought it, took these pictures into the grade school now, they would say there's no way in heck that they're going to let me look at these. But when I was a kid, they put this Mitchell show on, and it was old time music, uh, John Foster, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. Stephen Foster, I'm sorry, what did I say? His brother John. Yeah, <laughs> Stephen Foster, his son. Stephen Foster, and, you know, the, our musical play, we sang music like that, it wasn't current stuff. Well, anyway, they did this minstrel show, and, and the people, what they did is they blackened their faces, and they sang songs and danced and act silly. And it was called, it was like a comedy thing. Do you remember this, Dick? Oh, I was there. Well, <laughs> uh, my dad, my dad had this, he, he, had, he had this, wait, my dad's hair was black when I was a kid. And it, he had actual hair, you know, he had not, not as much when he got older, but. And for this minstrel show thing, he got this, clown's wig and he had a string that was you know went down the back of this thing and he would put his hand in here and he would just very lightly tug on this and his hair would flop up in the <laughs> and when I was a kid I thought that was the greatest thing well anyway these are pictures some of these are pictures of the minstrel show with the blackened faces and that sort of thing the other ones are Grange programs um, 
and you can kind of see they did skits and, and all that kind of stuff. And the, you know, this was the entertainment most of these. Um, I also included in our women's club contingency isn't here tonight, but the old women's club thing was huge and um, a very social thing for women. It, it, you know, everybody did that. So anyway, I'm going to just pass these around. Um, anyway, the one in the middle is is really the best one. Um, anyway. you? No. <laughs> That's kind of just my feeling. Anyway, um, what we would ask. Identify who you are. By the way, I didn't, I broke the rule. Norman told me to identify. If you don't know who I am, I'm married and I'm there. Don't figure that one. Um, and I recognize you. You were probably that tall the last time I saw you. Yeah, I'm Rich Young, Dickens, Peter and Kathy, my older brother and sister. And we have Matt Blythe, who is my younger generation. And then we have the next younger generation, Dave Whitefield. And we have Matt. The oldest No, I, I'm the next youngest. He's the oldest. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and our old, and our old. Uh, but the whole idea is, I'm just going to let them kind of chit chat. I'm going to put. I'm not going to make you go first. I don't think it's going to be. But we, we want to encourage everyone to kind of just ask questions or talk or you don't have to be a native in Mountain World to be a part of this. It was just like an idea. Let's just talk about history. There you go. I'm done. moved to Moulton Borough in about 1957. They moved over to Goss Corner, which is the intersection of Old 109 and 109 where the Wallaces live today. And next door to the Wakefields. And um, then they moved to, uh, my dad went to Lamprey and Lamprey, I guess. Um, and then they moved to Lakeport uh, for a while. Then 1968, they bought Homestead Farm, which is currently Old Orchard Inn on Lee Road next to uh, the woodshed. And that's where I grew up. So I, I was born in uh, December of 64 in Laconia and I uh, moved to Moulton Borough in 68. Um, some of my uh, you know, memories of Moulton Borough growing up is, of course I remember, just like most of you do in this room, I remember uh, Ellen's General Store and uh, that was that green on some painted cement. I remember, I remember going in there. My mother says that ice cream when I was a little kid was five cents. That might seem a little low, but maybe it was a dime or something for a scoop of ice cream, I don't know. And another memory that I have of uh, Moulton Borough Village is that um, when I was a kid, we used to go to Dr. Ratza, and he was in the village. Uh, some of you shaking your heads, yes. And uh, that's where Lacewood is, now across from Laconia Savings Bank. And I don't remember him having the best bedside manner, but I guess he would fix me up if I wasn't feeling well. So, remember Dr. Ratza. Um, Another thing that I remember uh, about Moulton Borough back in the day is that when you would go to the uh, dump and see Clarence Fry, if you were really lucky, you met this gentleman by the name of Pete Burnham. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pete Burnham drove a white, I don't know, station wagon, and uh, you have my word that it was chock-a-block full of stuff. And uh, my dad would tease me, I think, and tell me that there were rats in that car. It made me feel, made me feel a little bit uncomfortable, but I always thought he was a kind of an interesting character. Um, I also remember way back in the day that, uh, well, for me anyway, um, I remember uh, Doc Mallet, a former road agent, had his restaurant at the top of uh, 20, on uh, the neck, between Obershawns and Ames. So you'd go in there, and he had little stools, and you would actually eat. You know that thing? Doc Mallet's place? Yeah. Yes. And we're in the leaders group. I, I, I'll have to with you to confirm my, my oh, childhood. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you remember yeah. the parrot? I do. Thank you. I, 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 yes, absolutely I do. Okay. Yeah, that's right. He had the parrot. Uh, so my first grade teacher was uh, uh, Danny Whitehouse. And I think that was her last year uh, teaching. So I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. That in my class, I think she retired. So. What's that? That yeah, that could be. That could be. And um, so when I was in fifth grade at Moulton Central School, uh, I don't know if it was a pop 
population thing or whatever, but um, we were in the basement. We had Miss Miller, who of course was a principal for years, and Miss Solar, and we had a great, uh, a great year with them as teachers. And then my sixth grade year at Milton Rural Central School was uh, the new addition, the open classroom concept, and uh, as they pretty much know today down there. So that was kind of exciting. And uh, I went to Kingswood for three years. My older brother and sister graduated from Kingswood, and then. I was the third class, class of 83, to graduate from uh, Milton Borough Academy. So going back just a little bit, when I was a little guy playing sports, I used to enjoy playing sports, uh, Milton Borough kids used to go to Meredith for baseball, soccer, and basketball. So I used to play on Foss Insurance, but it was over at the Meredith Elementary School and the Legion team for baseball. And I uh, used to really in enjoy those, those years. Um, not done yet, so don't give up. I'm trying to think so much about the memories. Uh, oh, I was going to say that uh, my senior year at Baltimore Academy, the basketball team, we won our first game. It was a great start. We lost every game in between. We won our last game. It was like a triple overtime game. I think I scored about 33 points, so that was a, a pretty exciting uh, way to end the, the high school basketball career. And another statistic that I will bore you with is that I pitched a lot of games at Milton Borough Academy in 10th and 11th and 12th uh, grade, and I'm confident that there will never be a more losing pitcher in the history of Milton Borough Academy, because I, I, I don't think we won a, a game for three years that I played. So, so that's a record I will hold on to. Um, Congratulations. You're thanks, a great thanks, man. Thanks. Uh, and I spent most of my career, uh, I started police work in 86 in Milton Borough under Chief James Woodman. And I think there were, in 86, I think there were five full-time guys. And since Jimmy's still with us, I can't tell you some of the stories, what it was like working for that man, but he was an interesting chief of police. I can promise you that much. Great, great guy. Um, can I interrupt you? Please? You sure can. Jim Woodman, I was, it was my first year as selectman, and I had the graduation from the police department. And uh, the select board, Bob Hall of Pain and Ernest Davis and me went to Concord. And then there was a picture made with one of the selectmen, happened to be me, Jim Woodman, with Rich Young, the graduate, in the middle, and it was like Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> if I was sitting between those two guys tonight, it would be high Ohio. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so anyway, um, the bottom line is that growing up on Homestead Farm in Moulton Borough, uh, when I was, I think, 12 years old, I'm not making this up, my father, for, for my birthday, he just told me to close my eyes and put my hands out. So I closed my eyes and put my hands out, and he dropped a set of keys in my hand, and it was a 1960 Chevrolet Impala. And I was a 12-year-old boy on Homestead Farm, and I drove around those roads and in the orchard, and I uh, just had a fantastic childhood and wonderful memories of the swimming at Leeds Mills and then leaving town and going up to the pothole and sandwich and the like. And, uh, and my wife, Rhonda, and I have two kids who both graduated from Milton Borough Academy and now are in college. And it's just kind of cool that uh, they go to the same high school that I, I went to. So those are some of my fond memories of Milton Borough. And, I won't bore you with police stories because some of them are probably a little too close to home. But, <laughs> but I've enjoyed police work. I'm, I'm currently the chief deputy at the Carroll County Sheriff's Office. Uh, and I enjoy, I retired three years ago as a chief in Sandwich and went to work for Ball Pete for a few years. And uh, the recent sheriff that came in um, asked me to come back. So I, I'm back in police work and I'm very much enjoying that. So those are my stories. Thank you for listening. They didn't have any questions? I used to like to kiss the girls at Leeds Mills. Um, that was exciting. I remember that. I, I was in sports, and I did a couple of plays. Uh, we did, I was in the play Oliver. I remember that, you know, memory. Um, but no, it, it was just, it was fun to go to Kingsford for a few years, get a taste of that size of the school, and then get it in our own school. We were very, very, very proud of Moulton Borough Academy. And I, uh, I just remember, like, even in my gym locker, I didn't have to put a lock on the locker. I could leave my baseball glove in there, and we didn't lock the lockers and things like that. Oh, it's one of the things that dates me a little bit, but not that much to some of you people, is that I remember 
In Molten Girl, if you had a 476 exchange and your girlfriend did two of the all you had to dial was the last four digits of the number. You had to dial all, all the numbers. How come you're only calling girls? I'm uh, some of my guy friends too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. How many were they graduated? Uh, 37, and they were, uh, again, getting back to girls, there were only seven boys. So we had a <laughs> pretty, pretty good audience there. Yeah. I, I, I ain't got to go to prom, I was very loud. <laughs> Sometimes uh, this fellow named Foster Davis would be there too. And Foster was a local guy. And you probably knew him. And uh, he liked cider too. <laughs> <laughs> but he preferred vinegar because his cider was harsh. And uh, he. Uh, you tasted it? Oh, yes. <laughs> Not often. <laughs> oh, but, but that's why father, his was a lot better. Yeah. So. And, and we used to go over uh, smelting at um, Blackie's Cove. And, uh, Kelly Brook. Kelly Brook. And uh, then smelting meant a lot because it was, uh, uh, it was a good dinner or two. And it, if you remember smells, that was that was good food. And uh, I remember uh, it, it got really cold at night, and uh, God, there were a lot of people there, a lot of guys up along the, the brook waiting for the smells to run out. And uh, there was smelting etiquette. You you did not dip until the man at the mouth of the brook said, dip. If you started dipping early and the, the run of smell didn't get out of the brook, so everyone had the chance, uh, you got thrown out. <laughs> I mean, you were breaking the etiquette. Anyway, the smells just weren't coming up. And my old man gave me this stick that must have been 10 feet long. He said, scoot out there. See if you can get a move in it all. And, uh, on the ice. On the ice. <laughs> the thin ice. Uh, he said, but if you go through, hold on to that stick. <laughs> and, uh, so when I got home and my, oh, and I wasn't supposed to tell my mother. 
I'm going to say I was six. Six. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Ted, Ted Swain's son was here too, but he was a big fella. He was like a year older, and he liked ice cream or something. But I was the one that should have gone out there, so I did. Anyway, my, my mom caught me to that too. Uh, boy, she went through the roof. She didn't like it if I don't be it. So, yeah. It was uh, in the spring. In spring? Yeah. Do they still run? I oh, yeah. Know. You know, the lake was really low on snow for a long time. They're big fish. And they've closed up all the brooks on one of the sides. In fact, I think there's uh, only four lakes in the state that you can dip yeah. for smell. Uh, Cornway Lake is one. Um, uh, Sun Cook is another. Anyway. Just a load of wick balls. Yeah. Why did they close it? Uh, to keep the bait fish for the sports. Feed the carpenter sports. Suckers. Carpenter suckers, yeah. Now see, a carpenter sucker is a salmon. And uh, that's because the uh, commissioner uh, of the fish and game was a gentleman named Mr. Carpenter. Ralph. Ralph Carpenter. That's right. <laughs> All right. And uh, that's when he, he thought um, he make Winnipesaukee a really good sport fisherman lake in salmon. And you, that's when you couldn't take salmon through the ice. Well, in the winter time, when a lot of folks uh, weren't working and fishing had a real meal together, you know, you couldn't get the salmon anymore. And most local folks didn't like that. That's why they called salmon uh, carpenter suckers. And we used to go over to Shannon Brook a lot, mm -hmm. dipping. But Shannon Brook was a dangerous brook. Uh, you could take one step and all of a sudden be over your head. And uh, but there were a lot of smelt up there. Yeah, us little guys um, stayed, stayed out of the water. That was for the big boys. Grown guys. <laughs> Bud King. Bud? Yeah, Bud and Jackie King. Norman. Norman Ezra. Norman. Okay. Uh, who was the first? Uh, Cliff King was a brother and an uncle of mine. And Bernard. Yeah. Okay. Bernard was the biggest junkie in yeah, Central New York. But explain junkie. Yeah, explain yeah, junkie. Yeah, explain junkie. <laughs> 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 junkie is a fellow that collects everything. Oh, junk. A junkie oh, is a guy. <laughs> <laughs> junkie <laughs> is a guy that looks at a bottle cap and he knows that's going to be useful someday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that man.
Yeah. So to keep, if you're going to keep one in, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 He was funny. In fact, um, we were living on um, Castle Shores Road when uh, our son was born. It was, it was a home birth. So Denise, uh, you know, you focus on something when you're giving birth. This is what I'm told. I never have. <laughs> but she was pretty intent on focusing on something. And it turned out to be Will Witten coming down Castle Shores Road on his ride on lawnmower, because that's how he drove to town most of the time. From his house way over near near uh, Ball B. Down to down on his, yeah, yeah. On his John Deere lawnmower. I could hear him coming a long way off, and I thought, by the time he gets to this house, this baby is gonna be born. <laughs> 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 but it seemed a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Hope was there. He was willing to do that. No, made house calls. Yeah, so Caleb no. was literally born in Moldenboro. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 We and when I came to, I thought, <laughs> oh, that's a good looking baby. <laughs> 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 Matt, you want to go? Get it over here. Hey. <laughs> I'm Matthew Blood. Uh, my father was the athletic director of Moldenboro School District for 17 years. He taught at the uh, school for uh, 30-something years, I think. He just recently retired. Uh, my biggest memories were basically with him and Nat King, Mr. Wakefield, Richie Young. I grew up with all these guys. Um, I actually, one of the memories I have of him playing basketball for my father and um, let's see what the other coach's name Gary Tyrone. Gary Tyrone. Um, and I would grew up going through sports because my dad was the athletic director and coach, and uh, my sister was a big softball star from Homero. Um, my biggest memories of fishing with my father, Nat, um, and I remember the fishing year we used to have down at uh, the Palm Ridge down here. Yeah. Um, and that was a very, yeah, that's, that's been a long time since we used to go there. Um, uh, we grew up on the Sun Harbor side of Montmoreau on Lakeshore Drive. So I remember Robin's Country Store, not right. Allen's. That's right. Yeah. Um, and the owner, he was, a, he was a very large man, I remember. And I remember my father bringing me in one day to get some ice cream. I went with a candy bar. And he said, no, you're getting an ice cream. And I said, no, nope, I'm having a candy bar. And I put it in my pocket. I was about five years old. And we got home. And I took it out of my pocket. And I said, no, you're going right back down there. And you're heading into it. Well, I was a very shy young person. I didn't like to speak to with a lot of people. I was very, I wouldn't like to speak in groups. Well, he made me march right in there and hand that candy bar back. And all he said was, you're welcome in here anytime as long as you don't put stuff in your pocket. <laughs> and I said, yeah, no. thank you very much. So we always go down there. You always give us ice cream. Did you take the candy bar back? No. You took the smashed up candy bar? Yes. Yes. Mr. Grimaldi. Um, a big memory that just happened is my dad was uh, softball field was dedicated to him at the school. Um, so now it's known as Harry Blood Field. So that's most of my memories are within sports and watching half the people that I know of older adults. I used to watch them play sports in high school and um, Pete Hopkins and uh, Matt Swebber, the coach of Moldenboro Academy. Watched, they used to chuck basketballs at me. <laughs> when my dad coached them, they used to make me run around the court and they would like, throw basketballs. <laughs> hmm? Did you perform too for some of the shows at school? I remember. <laughs> Is that what that was called? <laughs> they just stuck you on the stage and told me to dance around. Um, no, you worked with sports. 
Yeah. What class you had? I was class of the 99. Classmate to my daughter. Yeah. Monks. So no, we actually graduated with 57 kids. Oh. Or 58 kids, something like that. Huge class. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't compare to your class. <laughs> um, I also had my father as a sixth grade teacher at the elementary school. Um, so I could never tell him I didn't have homework. <laughs> He knew, he knew I was lying. I was like, right, 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 right. Did you ever try that? <laughs> and another thing was they, the, the school nurse, whenever I got sick or pretended I was sick, um, would always call my mother, who taught in Laconia, and not my father that was four doors down, because they didn't want to interrupt him during class. So my mom would have to leave school in Laconia and come get me and drop me off at one of our neighbor's houses and then go back to school. Uh, so that was very interesting. Did your father make that deal with her? <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know. That was, that was my mom's job was to come get me at school, so I think that's what it's What did you do for fun besides play baseball? Did you get in any other kind of activities? <laughs> <laughs> um, He's back in the no. um, I, I enjoyed fishing. That was yeah. <laughs> it's one of my biggest loves in life is fishing. So we, I do that a lot. Um, according, I mean, with my dad, um, and we fish all over. We fish Winnipesaukee. We fish Sandwich Notch. Uh, we drive out to Pulaski, New York, to the Salmon River. Um, we go up to Nat King's Camp and fish out in Pittsburgh um, and all over. Go to the coast of Maine where my sister lives in Kennebone Port to go after striped bass. Um, but we try to fish any kind of species whenever we can. It doesn't cost us a lot of money by buying chargers or anything like that. So. I want to add something from that, and that's being humble. With good, uh, great athlete his sister was, and she was, but I will tell you this, if you go down to home plate in Moulton Borough baseball field, and you have somebody hit, excuse me, pitch you a softball, he can hit it with ease into the tennis courts. So he's one of the few guys I know, he can crush the ball in, in our softball league. This guy right here, he's a fantastic athlete himself. Thank you. Yeah, he can hit the ball a long way. <laughs> Only so many people can say that they have done that, hit a ball into the tennis courts. Well, I always, I always was pretty a decent baseball player. I was very good at batting. And one day I took a bet from my sister, which was when I uh, played at Keene State, broke every record at home, bro. Broke every record at Keene State. And I, as a senior, hit 24 home runs in a season. And that summer I told my sister I could hit a home run off of her. And I, all, I gave, she gave me 10 pitches. Touch one of the balls that came out. <laughs> so, I was good, but she was that much better. <laughs> uh, uh, it's been an advantage for me to go last because things that these guys have said, I won't remember everything that they reminded me of as they went along. But uh, I'm Dick Wakefield, I grew up in town. I was born at Huggins Hospital in Wolfboro. Uh, my folks lived when I was born at Dr. F.S. Lovering Lane. It was, they called it a camp back in there. It's where it's been expanded two or three times and added on to it. Uh, this Loretta, I think Loretta Reed, Loretta Reed still lives there. But uh, when I was six months old, we moved to the Goss place. My folks bought at your nanny Goss house uh, from their estate at Goss Corner, which is the corner of 109, old 109, and Bob Children. And I grew up there, and my daughter grew up there. Um, I can, it's interesting how things have changed. This was a really small, as Mary said, life was pretty simple. And if you were a kid, eight, nine, ten years old, and you had a bicycle, you could go anywhere. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things that kids would do, we would go, we'd stop and visit people, the elderly people, Elmer and Addie Berry, Hazel and Berry, uh, my grandfather and uh, his, his wife, my step-grandmother, uh, Will Wakefield and Edna uh, Welch Wakefield. Uh, I'd go up and fish in the halfway brook and I'd catch these little, little native trout. They weren't very big, you could have 10. And I'd catch 10 trout and clean them. And then I'd get on the bicycle and pedal over to Elmer and Addie Berry's house and uh, bring them the trout. And it was a good deal for me because they'd sit me down at the kitchen table with a big glass of milk Molasses cookies that she'd just taken out of the oven. A treat. Uh, Addie Berry didn't change her name <clears throat> when she married. Uh, she married Alma Berry, but uh, Addie was a sister to uh, Isilla and uh, Ern uh, Ernest Berry, who was the town tax collector for years. Lovely old couple. They never had children and they just loved kids. And all the kids were. Go see them. Just go visit them. Talk to them. I wish I'd taken a notebook mm -hmm. and, and written it down. Uh, let's see. Went to school at Moulinboro Central School. I was in the second, first grade class there. So, so I started in the fall of 1950. And Fanny Whitehouse, there were, there were, it was the triumvirate. It was Fanny yeah. Carter Nelson Whitehouse. Clara Richardson Perkins and Irma Tilton. Fanny had grades one and two, Clara had three and four, mm -hmm. Irma had five and six, and the token male principal would have seven and eight. And I had George Bryanton in grade seven and Roger Person in grade eight. It was his first year in uh, You behaved when you went to school there. My, I can remember. Well, I had to be taught to say Mrs. Whitehouse instead of Fanny <laughs> because she was a cousin. You know, and she, she started teaching at Whiteface School in Sandwich in 1940. Came to Moulinboro, I'm not sure what year, but my brother certainly had it for the first four grades because when my brother was in school, there were two schools still in town, Green's Corner, and the, the school over here at Moulinboro Corner, which was uh, used to be True B. I think, is Betsy Real still, and Dave Real still live there? No, she moved out to California. Oh, she did? Yeah. yeah. Oh, he did? Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, but uh, at this school, uh, Fanny had grades one through four, and Irma had five through eight. Big class. Uh, my graduating class from grade eight in Moulinboro, ten of us. Eight of us are still alive, <coughs> to the best of my knowledge. But the only only classmate that's local is uh, Judy Placeton. That isn't her married name. I can't remember her married name. She's the sister of Richard. Talked about Green's Corner, uh, Doc Mallet's restaurant. When I was a kid, the Peter's Grill, and my aunt Charlotte had a house in Ames Road. I think it's called now. But it was, that was a driveway, and uh, the Cambridge House sat in there. It was the, the new Cambridge House, which was built after the original Cambridge House burned in I think 19. 13 or 14, and then they built the, the Gambrell style, and it's there now. Uh, and there were, uh, she had, it was like a rest home. There were several elderly residents there, and she cooked and did everything uh, for them. Inside, inside Charlotte White House's house? Is there a house in that on the Yes, yeah, the big house. Yes. Yeah. Well, Charlotte, yeah, it's my they father's sister. Her, so I, I was inside that house. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, Cheryl, uh, my father was one of six uh, children, and, and Charlotte uh, lived in town. She married first Harold Ames. No, she mm -hmm. married first Charles McCormick, and they had the son Arthur. And she married uh, Harold Ames, mm -hmm. and they had Roland, William, and Richard, okay. yes. Dr. Ames. And uh, later on in life, uh, she, she was widowed, and then she married uh, Henry Whitehouse. And if I sat here long enough with the pencil and paper, I could tell you how Henry was related to uh, Charlie Whitehouse, who married Fanny Carter and Nelson Whitehouse. <laughs> <laughs> can't do it off the top of my head. I'm getting a headache. I think it's been some time. sometimes. And, uh, Right, at, right where you turned into that driveway was uh, Wilbur Dearborn. Yep. And Molly yep. used to do it. And who? Some Molly. Molly Dearborn. Oh, okay, yeah. That was the wife. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, remember, I remember him more well because he, you'd see him out, out there and, and he was, he had a lot of stories to tell. Uh, my father had a million stories in most of them. You know, we could sit here for hours. I'm not going to do that to you. But, and some of them I can't tell. Because one time when I got kind of interested in genealogy, I went to the library and got into the collection of Mulder Town Reports and I wrote down everything. Because we didn't have a copy of that. I had copied out everything that had anything to do with family. I said, look at this thing. This is your cousin here, and you've been married. And five months later, they had their first child. <laughs> that was rather premature. I'm going to change names here. I'm just going to say John Smith. His dad said, oh, that's all right. John Smith was the father anyway. <laughs> and, uh, there, there, are, there are some others like that. But you can't, you can't tell. We need to shut their coat <laughs> uh, it's one. Yeah. I a story from the peanut gallery here. Yes. The same barn that he's talking about on Ames Road. When I was a child, I was born in 51, and we summered here, and we rented from um, Charlotte uh, down on Lake Kanasaka. There were cottages, and we rented there every summer, and I stayed there every summer for the whole summer. Mm -hmm. And went up to Doc Mallard's and Dirty Louie's store. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the cracker ball. Cracker ball. Cracker ball. Yeah. But we used to play in the barn on rainy days. The Ames kids and I. Um, mm -hmm. Debbie Ames. Debbie and David. And Will. Dave Ames Dave and Willie and Gary. And, Gary Willie. and my brothers. And we would play there. And there was a rope swing. And we could swing back and forth in the barn. And it was just beautiful up there. But when we got tired of that, uh, Leah Ames, who had been married to Will Ames Sr., had worked for Art, for Arch, uh, Bob Montana. And she was a, she filled in the words in the balloons in the Archie comics. Mm -hmm. And there was boxes and boxes of comic strips and original cells, oh some gosh. of them without the words written in. And we used to just spend hours reading through those. So it was a lot of fun, and that was right in Mulberry, and who knows what's up in that barn. Yeah. And I think they have with you, we went to those cottages as children. My grandfather yeah. was with the Emsons, who hit the windmill farm, if you remember it, years ago when the horse farm is now, he's probably turning in his grave. Um, but when Sears Jr., we rented, when I was very little, early 50s from Shop, and then purchased land. <laughs> Yeah. And my father my father would dig his potatoes and uh, give me a bushel well, some bushel baskets and I'd go out and I'd pick up the potatoes and, and round up a bushel of basket of potatoes for a dime. So that was you know, hmm. and I, I was not that old. I could carry sixty pound bushel of potatoes. Well I was a little more than sixty. Give me rounded it up. Give me bricks. Do you remember <laughs> picking apples at the court, the, the Larsons, when the Larsons had it? I don't know if you did it, but like 10 cents, they had these great big, like, 
bags that had a strap on it, and you, you know, oh, yeah. I couldn't fill it and walk with it, let alone. So, I mean, it would take me to, you know, I'd have to take the apples and then they'd put them in a crate and then they'd give you 10 cents, you know. It was like, and at the end of the day, you'd have a dollar and 80, 80 cents. <laughs> a whole day's work. Yeah. Rex, up, I have a funny, an interesting story about um, them. They, Ingrid and Linda were about my, I was kind of sandwiched in between them in, in terms of age, and I used to stay with them. And they, like Dick said, were from Estonia. And she had, in the back now where it's all parking lot, they had gardens back in the back of their house, and I don't know if you remember them, but they were absolutely magnificent. I mean, vegetables and roses and just everything that they grew, it was just like, I mean, it was just unbelievable. And my mom was a gardener, and so she would go to Helby and say, Helby was his wife, and he, you know, what do you guys do? Well, they would be fishing down at Lee's Mills when we would be down there. Alex would be down with his fishing pole, and you know we would catch what we called suckers. I don't know what you call them now, what kind of fish they were, but trash fish. We didn't keep them. They were so much fun to catch, and we we loved catch them, but you threw them back in. You didn't keep them, but they kept them. And we were like, what do you keep those fish for? Because no, nobody would eat them. We took them home, and they buried them in the garden, and that's what they fertilized the garden. We tried it down on Lee's Road, and it, all we ended up with was wreck <laughs> stuff digging them up. I guess. Oh, if you've got a pet dog, that's terrible. <laughs> they dig them up and roll them. Oh, yeah. Do you remember the smell of going into his office? Yes. Do, you, do you remember that? It was like you went into that front to the where the waiting room was, and he had these chairs that were had no arms on them, which was, you know, you're going in there and you're sick. And it's like, no arms on the chair. It was like, and they were kind of, do you remember? But you walked in and it just had, it was like, it wasn't, it was sterile smelling, but it was like, it was just a weird smell. Strong, I mean, I could still, yeah, something that just, and you know, you walked in and it was like, oh, I don't think this is going to be good. Nice. <laughs> and he'd take you in and it wasn't like, a, you know, he had an exam room type thing, but usually you always ended up in his office. He had this big dark desk with a chair next to it, you know, of course you don't do a kid. And when I was little, I was deathly allergic to poison ivy. I, I mean, so bad that I would be bedridden because I would just get so infected with it. And so the first year, my parents were, you know, it got so bad that I, they were carrying me in and out to have blisters and stuff. It was bandaged, it was really disgusting. And so he would lecture me, you cannot, you've got to stay out of the poison ivy. You know, so the next year, I would take my bike, and back in those days, like Dick said, all we did was bike, ride bikes, and I would go up and down Lee's, Lee's Road, back and forth and back and forth, and I would go down, I would wait until to make sure there wasn't any traffic, and I would go down the middle of the road, because on both sides, it was like patches of poison ivy. Never got in again. I, I swear, we could not figure out, because again, I got the poison ivy, and it was like, you know, it was crazy. Dr. Rutz had finally figured out that it was, I was getting it from the dog. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. getting it from the dog. And he, that was the kind of doctor he was, that he would figure, he, very practical, you know, didn't, I don't think he doled out a lot of medicine. I don't remember taking, you know, like, when my kids were little, every time you went to the doctor, they'd give you penicillin or give you something. I mean, sure. they're always giving you pills. And I don't remember getting, medi you know, we just didn't do the medicine thing, but he would say do, this and he made house calls. He used to come to our house in, in any hour of the day and night because my, my grandmother lived with us six months of the year and she had heart trouble and her heart rhythm would, and he would come with his little bag and you know, he would just, and he'd sit. And most of the time he'd just sit and talk to her until she, you know, he just had kind of a, like you say, no bed, bedside manner, but call. Oh, and he didn't understand always what he was saying because he did have a very <laughs> accent. <laughs> But they, he was, and it was so sad when he, he, because nobody knew he was sick, and he ended up having cancer himself, and and passed really rather, maybe not quickly, in terms of what was going on in his purse, because they were very private. But um, you know, all of a sudden he was just gone, yeah. and it was 
really said something about up and down the roads, you know, the bicycle thing. That was something else I was thinking about today. Uh, deposit on bottles. Mm -hmm. oh, that's how I got my ice cream. Mm -hmm. you go up and down the road, you, back, you know, fill your basket on your bicycle, wire basket mm -hmm. in front of the Schwinn, one speed balloon tired bike. Mm -hmm. And uh, at Harold Moore's store, which had been Nelson Merrill before my time. There were two sizes of ice cream scoops. Little ones were nickel, big ones were dime. And Harold scooped the ice cream and did a great job. And tucked some <laughs> down inside the cone, topped it off. <laughs> the other ice cream one that was great, Memorial Day, we always had parade for. And at the end of the parade, ended up at the library, and Leela always gave every kid a free ice cream cone. And once a year, I ate cherry vanilla. I didn't really like it, but for some reason <coughs> on Memorial Day, I always got cherry vanilla, uh, the biggest, I mean, huge scoops of ice cream. And all the kids got, maybe it wasn't that many, it seemed like a lot at the time, but, but um, I don't know if the town paid for it, Behind the scenes, I think she just donated it. But. Does anybody do that? Oh, yeah. It was a big thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The big ones were nickel. Yeah. Those yeah. Ones, that's the one good thing about Valentine Hill. Of course, Valentine Hill, you could get a nickel for the uh, 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 I remember the to put some of my appendix when I was three. Uh, we moved my appendix when I was three years old. Like a hospital. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But we went, to, went here. And he said, drive immediately to work for our family. Yeah. That was a good one. That was my first experience with him. Not a good one. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I remember, too, that was kind of fun is party lines on the top. Uh -huh. You pick up the phone and you had to wait for whoever was using it to hang out. Yeah. And, or, and, and, listen, oh, yeah. and we would say, <laughs> play a lot of three, four, five, seven, three, and we talk to the operator instead of. Mm -hmm. line, line four, ring two. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the lady that lived, Annie Goss, the house that I grew up in, had listened in on the party line. And Roy Fox, his brother Clyde Fox, his name, actual name was Miller, R. Fox. Everybody called him Roy, mm -hmm. janitor of the school the forever. Sweetest man. But he, when he was courting his first wife, was Doris Davy from Sandwich. You could always tell when Annie picked up him, he, the phone would ring, she would call him or something, and he's answered the phone. I was holding one phone up here to talk, you know, it's the old fashioned phone. <laughs> All of a sudden, you could hear the mantel clock ticking which was near Annie Goss's telephone. <laughs> <laughs> and so Roy uh, did, wanted to say some more, slightly more personal things on the telephone, I guess, than he wanted Annie to hear. So uh, he was talking to Doris, and all of a sudden he hears tick, 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 like that. And he said, and how are you today, Annie? And she said, I'm fine, Miller. Oops. And then hung up. <laughs> I can remember when we got a private line because of that, that business, you know, it was like he couldn't have, and we were, when we were kids, we were not, if we didn't answer the phone, like, appropriately, we got killed, you yeah. know, and if you didn't learn to write a message down, you got killed, I mean, it was like, but it was a real scandal because we, dad was missing phone calls, and it, it I guess it was the thing with the party line, and so we were one of the first in town, first people to have a private line, and that was kind of like, when I was a kid, that was like, uh, you got a private line. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I like, remember my mean? mother, like, every other time she answered the phone, she'd go, Agnes, it's for me, get off the line. <laughs> <laughs> Riding around, I monkey 
don't get materials or go look at a job. Uh, we're over on East Holderness Road. And uh, he mentioned that he got farmed out to some old folks there when he was uh, like eight, nine, ten years old. And uh, like nineteen twenty, and which wasn't uncommon because a lot of the older folks that had farms uh, didn't have kids that hung around the farm and go and work in the factory or uh, go to a bigger town, you know. And uh, he said, "Yeah, I, I remember we used to walk to the McClure's Hill Schoolhouse, or we might, if we were lucky, take a." A awesome buggy, you know. And I said, gee, you know, that's amazing. You took a horse and a buggy to school, and we have walked on the moon. That must be the biggest thing you've seen in your lifetime. We're driving along, and he goes, uh, REA. I said, what? I was like, REA, that's the biggest thing in my life. I said, what's that? He goes, yeah, the Rural Electri Electrification Act. He said that he thought all the counties were going to have electricity and the farms were never going to get it. And he said almost overnight, poles were run with one wire and every farmhouse got one wire with two lights. He said there was usually one light in the kitchen and one in the parlor. He says, that's the biggest thing in my life. And I thought, oh, that is really idle. My grandfather's second wife was Edna Wakefield, Edna Welch. She's a sister to Ernest Davis' mother, Bertha. And she was what you would call a saint. And she had two, actually, two light fixtures in the kitchen, one over the sink and one over the table in the kitchen, each for the Magnificent 15 watt bulb. <laughs> After summer, it was dark outside. She cleared the table with all the dishes over in the sink. Then she'd go back to the table, turn off that light, go across the room in the dark, and turn on the other one. <laughs> she'd go very quickly. And my father was sitting there one night, and she did that, and my grandfather had a way of kind of wrinkling up his nose, and he looked at my dad and winked, and said, some night, Edna, you're going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> From Matt's patient, that means get over there before the room starts. <laughs> Walked from downtown Meredith 
out to the Carlton Farm, which was seven or eight miles away. Oh, yeah. To uh, ask him if he could take one of the girls to the dance. And uh, he was a real serious man, apparently, because he told my old man, no, son. Dancing is just the vertical position of the horizontal desire, and you shall not take my daughter. <laughs> so so he, he went back to Barrett and to <laughs> and, and, and I said to her, I said, so, uh, did you know my father? And she goes, no, I was a little younger. I'm sure it's my sister. <laughs> She was pretty disgusted with me. And she said, uh, when he was born, <laughs> she said, one night at Huggins Hospital, they, they bring the babies in at 2 a.m. to nurse. And they mixed them up. <coughs> and she said, all of a sudden, I heard yikes from the other side of the room. And uh, apparently, that woman had been handed, had a little girl, and she'd been handed. Boy. <laughs> Apparently, I was enthusiastic. <laughs> and, and, and my friend Bonnie Simpson was there, and she said, Well, what baby did you have? She said it was a girl. I should have kept her. <laughs> so I told, this, I told this story last year at my 50th high school reunion. Betty Adjutant, whose name is Mulner. She's one of the ones from the 50, 50 years ago that you could readily recognize. I used to tell people she was my first girlfriend because I was born October 28th at Huggins and she was born on the 30th. <laughs> and I used to tell, you know, in high school, I always used to hold hands over the best net. <laughs> and uh, Jean Gould Morrison was standing there. And she said, well, I was there at that same time. I was born November 1st. And used to, you know, to say in hospital two weeks back when I was born. Yeah. And I said, well, might have been your mother. Might have. I don't, I never saw her face. It's getting a little rough here. <laughs> Back in 1955, I used to come up here on the weekends. That's when the hardware store was down, was uh, up by the fountain, and uh, the market was down where the hardware store is. Well, anyway, where the Victorian House Foundation is now, behind Eats, used to be an inn, and it was a French couple. Well, anyway, I used, to, I used to bring my mother up and she would stay there. And I got friendly with one of the waitresses, so I started dating her. So anyway, what, hap what happened was, the barber shop was up over the hardware store across from the fountain. Mm -hmm. And the yellow house was his house. Now, I'm, I'm not sure where that, it seems to me that they moved the yellow house from behind the library. No, they haven't. They, ha they haven't? Okay. The barber shop, or the barber rally, used to say to me, because I didn't, he didn't want anybody to make any noise, because I was dating a girl and she would go in the house. The, the barber, the idea was for the barber, I could stay in his house, so I would stay over in the yellow house where the, where the barber, he had two bedrooms over there. And they put, they got permission from a couple that owned the inn to put me over there, so I used to stay there. I was <laughs> uh, throw that in. <laughs> then we lived here from 84 until 1984. Uh, we bought the land in 84, over a large home uh, down by the uh, Wynn McCormick. We had a lot of homes. And uh, we moved out in 99, and we live in Florida now. And now, for the summer, we come up here every year, and we stay over the Mayo Farm. We traveled 14 years with three motor homes all over the country. So well, now we stay at the fifth wheel of the Mayo Farm in the summer. Still enjoy the area. Yeah. I remember Richard way back. 
<laughs> Does anybody know who was at the bottom of the ramp at Keith's hardware store telling you not to run down the ramp? Nancy Kelly. <laughs> 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 my little brother was in so much trouble. Yeah. So much trouble because it didn't matter. He <coughs> got in that thing and he was just like, Pew! for that ramp. Yep. And there was always this lady down there that was <laughs> at the bottom of the thing that would. Yeah. Make it yes. I was so excited to find that out because so when I came back, it was like, Nancy Kelly. <laughs> oh my gosh. Nancy and I reminisce because I remember being extremely young and I was going to Nancy for my clothes in the side room in East. And being scolded, I'd have Nancy on one end of the ramp and my mother at the other end of the ramp, deciding who I wanted to face. <laughs> it was too tempting. Couldn't help but run down the ramp. We have some refreshments everybody can enjoy, and I hope that this wasn't too painful, and that you'll encourage other people that you know that, and they don't have to be natives of Molten Bar, just you know have an experience or grow up and. And um, we're going to try to contact nice people and really get, get this kind of project going. So there was a nice talk what, two, three summers ago. Uh, Kurt Quiddy did. And he was strictly the summer guy down on Langton Cove at, at the, at the Lamprey House. Mm -hmm. get, you know, so people with any kind of experience over the years in Walton Grove. Mm -hmm. I've been reminded of stuff tonight by these young guys that I've forgotten. Hopefully we get enough equipment and stuff at the museum that if people just stop in or whatever, that you know, we'll be able to at least gather, you know, some history or stories, whether we do the full-fledged thing like Sandwich does, which is really quite interesting. You know, just ask questions and you, and you answer them and it just, you know, the memories just come. That would be an interesting thing to develop.